Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to talk. According to my watch, I've got five extra minutes, right? Yeah. No, <laughs> just kidding. So I'm going to update you on update you on where we are and identifying genes for thoracic aneurysms and dissection. And what I'm talking about are genes that predispose to sending aneurysms that lead to type A dissections and also type B dissections. This seems to be a spectrum of disease presentation for single gene disorders, mutations in single genes. And we know that very well from Marfan syndrome because a Marfan patient can present with an aneurysm, a type A dissection or a type B dissection. And the genes are emerging as an important factor, not only for identifying who's at risk for this disease, but also it informs us how to manage this disease. And this was emphasized in the 2010 AA American Heart Association and ACC treatment guidelines, and that there's, um, and it, it emphasized this gene-based management. And what we'd like to go for, as we go forward, um, hopefully we'll have uh, more and more genes and that will inform how to manage these patients um, as far as the aneurysm presentation, the timing of surgery, risk for other vascular disease and uh, associated uh, features. So when I'm talking about a genetic risk, there's a wide spectrum in the patients that you see. At one end, as all of you know, are the syndromic presentations. And these are due to single gene variants in um, mutations in one gene. And these patients have a high risk for aortic disease, early onset. And they, come, they also have associated features. In the case of Marfan syndrome, those are skeletal features. And I think most of the people in the audience are aware of what those features are. In addition to the syndromic presentation, there's individuals that have a family history of the disease and that in, that's indi indicates that it's due to a single gene being mutated out of the 20,000 genes that we have in our genome. John Ritter is an example of that. He presented with a dissection. After he presented, we imaged his brother, who was found to have an aneurysm, and he underwent repair. It turns out that Tex Ritter, his father, died suddenly and may have also, may have also died of an acute aortic dissection. So these are really the genes that I'm going to be talking about today. These confer a very high risk for disease. If you identify mutation in these genes, the individuals have a, a, a very high uh, lifetime risk, and for something like Marfan syndrome, that approaches 100% risk. And then the, we know there's genetic variants that, are pre, uh, that predispose people like um, Richard Holbrook to thoracic aortic disease, the, in, um, but we're just beginning to identify those genes. I'm not going to talk about those because right now those don't have clinical implications as far as identifying individuals at risk or disease management. And then finally, at the far end of the spectrum are people that have had dissections like Michael DeBakey, um, but where we think it's just wear and tear on the aorta. I don't think Dr. DeBakey had much in the way of genetic risk factors and just had a lifetime of wear and tear on his aorta. So when we're talking about syndromes and thoracic aortic disease, all the syndromes that we've identified to date have with them some degree of, of Marfan skeletal features. Um, these syndromes also tend to be in individuals that present at relatively young age. These syndromes are inherited in an autosomal dominant manner. That means it gets passed from one generation to the next. If an individual has the disease, they have a 50-50 risk of passing it on, the, the disease gene onto their children. And for these syndromic presentations, the individuals present with aneurysms at the level of the sinuses of Valsalva, the root aneurysms. And here's a list of the syndromes, and I'll go through them uh, relatively quickly and talk about the differences in presentations and the difference in management of these patients. Uh, most people know about Marfan syndrome. The um, skeletal features are very pronounced, and it makes it easy to identify people with Marfan syndrome. Marfan syndrome is the only syndrome that has with it um, uh, ectopia lentis. And um, this is a very, appears to be a specific finding for Marfan syndrome. And we know how to manage these patients. So we do routine imaging of the aorta. This can be done 
by echocardiography because they have these root aneurysms. We recommend surgical repair once they're five, about five, five and a half centimeters. And we're low, we know they're at low risk for further vascular disease, um, such as abdominal aneurysms and intracranial aneurysms. But the story is very different as far as the presentation and vascular disease risk for patients with Lois Dietz syndrome. Lois Dietz syndrome is due to mutations in genes called TGFBR1 or a gene called TGFBR2. At the severe syndromic end of the, of the disease, the patients have the skeletal features of Marfan syndrome, but also can present with abnormal skull formation, widely spaced eyes called hypertelorism, a bifid uvula, or even a frank cleft palate, and they often have very thin translucent skin where you can see the veins easily. Very reminiscent of what you see in the patients with a vascular airless Danlow syndrome. So here's some pictures of some patients with low esteets. You can see the widely spaced eye, the eyes, the abnormal skull formation. And the management of these patients are very different than the management of patients with FBN1 mutations and Marfan syndrome. We know these patients, in particular the patients with TGFBR2 mutations, are at risk for type A dissections with little to um, very minimal enlargement of the ascending aorta. And we are sending patients for surgical repair with just minimal dilatation um, as, as low as 4.2. I think D Dr. Dietz has even recommended 4.0 in adults. These patients also have very tortuous arteries, and that can be picked up in particular in the cerebral vascular circulation. Once they present with aortic disease, they go on to have aneurysms and dissections of other arteries, including intracranial aneurysms, splenic aneurysms, and, and so on. So we recommend that after that they have uh, lifetime imaging of their entire aorta, the branches off the aorta, and the cerebral vascular circulation. Um, so, uh, um, the next two syndromes I've talked to, I'm going to talk about have been just described in the past year. Osteoarthritis syndrome um, is due to mutations in a gene called SMAD3. These patients have ascending disease and have very early onset osteoarthritis. Um, the, uh, the presentation in these families are very interesting. Individuals in this family pedigree here with the mutation are shown in orange, and you can see they can present with thoracic aortic disease, intracranial aneurysms, iliac aneurysms, and abdominal aneurysms. So the disease presentation can basically affect multiple different vascular beds. And so, once again, in patients with SMAD3, we're um, recommending pretty um, aggressive imaging, of the, uh, similar to what we recommend in Lois Dietz patients. And we don't have any evidence currently that these patients dissect early. So we're recommending management more along the lines of the ascending aorta, similar to what we do for Marfan syndrome. And then we have a paper currently in press in Nature Genetics describing an aortic syndrome with very mild skeletal features of the Marfan syndrome. Once again, this is another gene involved in TGF-beta signaling called the TGF-B2 uh, gene. And in families uh, with this disease, the family members can present with thoracic aortic disease or intracranial aneurysms as shown in this pedigree. So in summary, if you have a patient with thoracic aortic disease and an aortic root aneurysm, and skeletal features that are, that are similar to Marfan syndrome, go ahead and refer to geneticists for diagnostic testing. The diagnostic testing will identify other family members at risk and will inform the management of that disease. If you see a patient with ectopia lentis and skeletal features, it's safe to assume that patient has Marfan syndrome. Uh, if you see a patient with craniosynostosis or the hypertelorism, think more low esteet syndrome. And if you see patients that, where, in which the family members have abdominal aneurysms or intracranial aneurysms, think um, SMAD3, TGFB2, or TGFBR1 and 2. So uh, once again, it's very important for the management of these patients and for family members' risks. Um, and I just want to go through what these genes do. With um, FBN1, I'll talk about in a minute, but the TGFBR1 and 2, SMAD3, and the TGFB2 genes 
All are involved in TGF beta signaling. Uh, transforming growth factor beta is a growth factor that's very important for main, maintaining smooth muscle cell function. TGF beta binds to receptors, the type 1 and the type 2 receptor. That complex is together and, um, and activates um, receptor SMADs, and then these go into the nucleus and alter the gene transcriptions, um, the genes that are transcribed by the cell. And we know from our studies that, that the genes that we're finding are all along the pathway. The new gene we identified is actually the TGFB2. It encodes TGF-beta-2, which is one of the three isoforms of TGF-beta. We have re mutations in the two receptors, the type 1 and type 2 receptors. SMAD3 is one of these um, downstream signaling molecules. So the mutations all along this pathway are telling us that this pathway is important, um, maintenance of this pathway is important for preventing disease. Interesting, most of the mutations we have identified are loss of function mutations and are predicted to decrease TGF beta signaling. But at the same time, we paradoxically see an increase in TGF beta signaling, and we don't quite understand what's going on at the molecular level. And I'm hoping in a couple of years from now, we have this sorted out. Um, so, and TGF beta signaling is very important for maintaining expression of contractile genes, uh, contractile proteins in the smooth muscle cell. And I'll get back to that in a, a few minutes. So that's the syndromic presentation. I'm going to talk briefly about the genes that we've identified. For people that don't have syndromic features, these Marfan skeletal features or other features, but do clearly have an inherited predisposition running in their family. Um, 20, about one fifth of patients have um, an affected family member, um, and that has, that has been elegantly worked out by Dr. Elif Teriades and his group. Um, these families show primarily that autosomal dominant inheritance similar to Marfan syndrome and the other genes for aortic disease. There can be decreased penetrance in a family, and that's where somebody gets the disease gene, can pass it on to their children, but not manifest the disease themselves. And there's a lot of variability in the associated features. We have families that have bicuspid aortic valves and aneurysms running in families. We have these families with intracranial aneurysms and thoracic disease, similar to the TGFB2 story. And we have families even with occlusive vascular disease like coronary artery disease and ascending aneurysms running in a family as a single gene disorder. And so the variability in the clinical presentation suggests that there's a large number of genes that can be altered to pre cause familial inheritance of thoracic aortic disease. And we already know from the syndromic presentation that there's already a lot of genes, and we still have more genes to identify for syndromic presentation. And the same is true from, for familial disease. And one thing that's important, if you see families with um, a family history, whether you know the gene or not, you need to image in, uh, family members um, who are at risk for inheriting the defective gene. And you can pick up asymptomatic aneurysms in these families and hopefully prevent type A dissections and premature deaths. And that's illustrated here. This individual was life flighted to Houston with a type A dissection and fortunately survived. He gave us a history that his uncle had a big aorta. We brought in all the family members with the asterisks next to their symbol. And you can see with imaging, that we can pick up a large number of asymptomatic aneurysms, and suddenly the genetic basis of this disease running through the family becomes very evident. And you get a lot more patients being referred into your surgical programs. <laughs> okay, so um, as I said, the familial, the clinical heterogeneity suggests a lot of genetic heterogeneity, and that is the case. We've identified these genes for familial disease, and right now, these genes only explain the disease in about a quarter of our families. So it was, 
um, 75 percent of the families that we have in our study still do not have an identified gene. These are the genes for the syndromic presentation. So uh, the take home message here is that people can present with inherited aneurysms without any of the syndromic features and still have a mutation in one of the TGFBR1, TGFBR2, and so on genes. And so um, uh, it, the lack of syndromic features does not exclude the possibility that one of these genes is altered in a family with inherited aneurysms. On average, these families without the syndromic features present come in at a, a slightly older age and a slightly milder disease than you see with the syndromic presentation. And then genes here, the ACTA2, MYH11, and MYLK, are genes in which we have not been able to identify much in the way of syndromic features. And I'll talk m uh, briefly about ACTA2 and MYH11. And I want to emphasize that these genes here are all involved in in um, contractile function in smooth muscle cell. And if you remember, the ascending aorta is essentially a muscle. It has that thick medial layer where there's layers of elastin fibers with layers of smooth muscle cells in between. Um, the elastic, the smooth muscles ha um, cells have actin and myosin filaments that move against each other to contract the smooth muscle cells with every pulse that goes through the aorta. These contractile filaments link up to the cell surface and then link up through to the elastic fibers through structures called microfibrils. The major protein in microfibrils is fibrillin, and the gene that encodes fibrillin is FBN1, and that is the gene that causes Marfan syndrome. So the FBN1 gene is actually encodes for a structural element in the aorta that links up to other genes like the actin and myosin gene that um, also cause disease. So patients with ACTA2 um, mutations um, look very normal. You would not pick them out from the population as shown by this young woman here. Um, this is the most commonly altered gene, altered gene for familial disease, and it's pre present in only about 10 to 14 percent of patients. And currently, we're recommending that ACTA2 be sequenced in anybody with a family history of the disease. Interesting, patients with ACTA2 mutations can present with ascending aneurysms, or they can present with occlusive vascular disease, including early onset coronary artery disease, strokes, and even an early onset stroke syndrome called Moya Moya disease. Aortic dissections less than a, uh, five centimeters uh, uh, in diameter are rare. Patent ductus arteriosus and bicuspid aortic valves are some of the car associated cardiac cardiovascular features. And we've seen a fair number of young men with type B dissections that have ACTA2 mutations. So if you see a young man with an unexplained type B dissection, think ACTA2 mutations, especially if that individual has a complication. Um, and, and, and as I mentioned previously, ACTA2 includes alpha actin, which is part of the actin filaments that are important for contractile function in the smooth muscle cell. Um, the, another gene is MYH11, which includes the, the myosin, which is another part of the contractile filament. We've only identified mutations in this gene in families with thoracic aortic disease associated with a patent ductus arteriosus. These aneurysms involve the ascending aorta and spare the sinuses, and so they differ very much from the syndromic presentation. We've seen a fair number of individuals have had dissections between 4.5 and 5 centimeters. So we're recommending surgical repair about 4.5 centimeters in these families. Um, and the last gene that we identified, this myosin light chain kinase, is actually a gene that controls smooth muscle cell contractile function. We don't have enough families with mutations in this gene yet to really uh, uh, clearly dictate the clinical management in these families. So in summary, summary um, the syndromic and the familial genes dictate the location and timing of location of the aneurysms and the timing of surgery. They determine the risk uh, 
for additional vascular diseases, and as far as the ACTA2 mutations, also dictate what other additional um, mutation individuals are at risk for. And this really supports this gene-specific management or personalized medicine for this disease. And so I just want to acknowledge some of the people that I work with, the people in my lab, and then I work with very talented cardiovascular surgeons in Houston, both Dr. Estrera and Safi, and Dr. Caselli and Lemaire, and I really want to recognize both uh, the, the, the surgeons. Um, and I want to mention we're recruiting families. We have flyers out on the table, and we, if you see families, we very much like to recruit them for our research program. So thank you. <laughs>